Oh, praise the Lord. Praise God. Can we take a moment and thank him? He is risen indeed. Lord, we worship you today. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I'm so glad to be serving a risen Lord and Savior. His name compares to no other. It is the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved. It is incomparable. It cannot be matched by another. The name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, don't you love that name of Jesus? Praise God. Thank you again for joining with us for this Resurrection Sunday at Greater Life. We're so glad that you're here, and we thank you for being with us on Facebook Live or on our website or on our conference call. And we also thank you for commenting and sharing this video. Praise God. Um, today I'm going to be speaking from the Gospel of Luke in the 24th chapter. If you'd like to begin to turn there with me. Um, we, on Good Friday, we celebrated the precious gift of Jesus, that he sacrificed his own life for our sins. We, we, we drew near to the cross. We celebrated that and we proclaimed his death till he comes, as the scripture has said. Today, um, we understand that Jesus was killed, he was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. Praise God. Our text is going to take place after those events on that third day. Because sometimes even the third day doesn't absolutely and initially meet our greatest hopes. That may sound shocking to some of you, but let me say that again. When we believe and we hold on to a promise and we've got hopes that perhaps it was God that would come through in the way that we believed he would or some other some days we get to that preset time and when we don't immediately perceive that God has already done the thing that he promised to do, our hopes can be dashed. Well, our scripture picks up in Luke 24. 4. We'll begin reading in verse number 13. If you'd like to turn there with me. Of two of these disciples, they had been in Jerusalem, experienced these events. They had waited in Jerusalem, um, but today's the third day. And they heard conflicting reports. Was Jesus risen? Was he not? They had heard reports that, that they had gone to the tomb, but the body was no longer there. The tomb was empty, but they still had difficulty believing. And these two men decide to make the long journey back from Jerusalem to a city called Emmaus. And in Luke 24... And verse number 13, it's written, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things that had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Could it be that in some of the darkest and loneliest times, even when we have felt that, that, that maybe we had a great hope in God and now we feel ourselves distancing ourselves from that hope, perhaps we've even turned around and we're walking back to an old life and we're walking it, perhaps in the opposite direction of where our hope was. Could it be that even in the darkest times that Jesus is still pursuing us, that Jesus is still loving us. He is still speaking to us even when we don't have eyes in those moments to see him. Today, in just a moment, I'm going to speak on this subject, the seven-mile road. Would you pray with me? 
Lord, today we've come here gathered in our homes today, God, gathered some with our families, some alone, some listening in on the phone, God. We've gathered here together to celebrate the resurrected Christ. God, we've, we put our, play, our hope in you today. God, there are some, Lord, that, that are suffering on this call, on this video. I, I understand that. There are some who are rejoicing and there are some who are weeping, some who are excited and some who are anxious. Today, God, I want to pray that you speak to us. It is written that your word is anointed. We know it's forever anointed and it accomplishes those tasks for which it's been sent. And so today, I want to pray that you anoint us. Give us ears that we may hear, eyes that would not be restrained, but eyes that would see. God, open our eyes to the word of God, to the great hope that is in you today. And as we receive these words of God, Give us a heart that would embrace the word of the Lord. It is written that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so today as these words of a timeless truth are spoken, I want to pray that there is a great faith that is generated and begins to rise up within us. Today, God, we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I pray that you have been able to feel the presence of God, the same that we have here in this room together. Today, I'd like to walk you through Luke chapter 24. I'm not preaching a, a fancy message by any means, but I want to speak the word of the Lord to you that you can receive it purely and clearly. So the events of Luke 24, we just watched a quick video before I came on about it. These events, we understand that very early in the morning on the third day, the, the, the disciples are together, there are women with them, and, and the women come to the tomb to bring spices, which they had prepared. But when they arrive, they find that the, the, the stone has been rolled away. And so they cautiously go into the tomb and they cannot find the body of the Lord Jesus. There are times in all of our lives when we've hoped for something, perhaps we've even prayed for that something, but our initial hopes and expectations have been dashed. And not unlike us, these women, their, their natural tendencies haven't experienced hurt and emotional trauma. Their tendencies were to believe the worst rather than the best. In fact, verse number four of Luke 24 tells us that they were greatly confused about this. And, and, and then two men stand beside them in shining garments. And these men uh, are preparing to speak. And the Bible says that these disciples are afraid and they bow their faces to the earth. And, and these men say, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen and then he, he reminds them of how Jesus spoke these, these same words to them while they were in Galilee and how he had told them that the Son of Man would be delivered into the hands of sinners. He would be crucified, but on the third day, and make no mistake, this was the third day, that on the third day he would rise again. And as these messengers from God speak these words, they call them back. They remember these words and they return from the tomb and they gather with the, the remaining 11 disciples into all of the rest. And, and as they gather there, they begin to speak of these words, not only of an empty tomb, but of the messengers of God, but to the other disciples who had gathered. It's written in verse 11 of Luke 24 that their words seem to them like fairy tales, yeah. idle tales, and they did not. Believe them. Because when we have gone through emotional trauma, when we have gone through the hardships of life, sometimes it's very difficult to believe what is true. Well, the scripture says Peter, 
Peter, and we know from another account that John went with him, they arose and ran to the tomb and stooped down, and, and, and Peter saw the linen clothes. They were lying by themselves, and he, he, he leaves, and he's marveling to himself at what had happened. There's a spark of belief in Peter's life. And then we pick up in verse 13, of which we read that these two men are traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus that's seven miles from Jerusalem. They had put their hope in this Jesus and make no mistake, they're discouraged. They've heard these reports, but they've still left confused, emotionally bruised, and discouraged. And they begin traveling in the opposite direction of their promise. Seven long miles to Emmaus. There they talked together of these things. They shared perhaps their disappointments and all of the events as they recounted them together. And as they were doing this and they were reasoning and trying to put meaning to it all, that Jesus himself, he drew near to them and he went with them. But their eyes couldn't recognize him. And they didn't know him. Aren't you thankful? Can you be thankful with me today that even in the times of your life where you may not have recognized or acknowledged that Jesus was with you, that he honored his word, he would never leave us, he would never forsake us, that Jesus leaves Jerusalem and the others to pursue these two disciples on the verge of unbelief. Their eyes couldn't recognize Jesus in those very moments. Well, he, he comes to them and he's speaking, asking them of the, what, they're, what they're talking about. And, and, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, he, he said, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And Jesus just said, What things? <laughs> The Bible says that God knows all things. In fact, it's written that he knows what we have need of before we even ask in prayer. Yet Jesus asks us to ask, to verbalize what we're feeling, not to hold it in, but to open up and to speak up in his presence and give voice to those emotions, to those things and and here they begin to explain those things of, of Jesus of Nazareth that must have been interesting for Jesus to hear their words about himself. And, and, he, and what they speak of him, they say things like this. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all of the people. And they speak of how these chief priests and the rulers delivered Jesus to be condemned to death, that he would be crucified and in verse number 21, they speak these insightful words. Would you look at that with me? In verse number 21, it reads, But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Have you ever been to that place where your we are hoping moved to we were hoping? where the God in whom you had put your trust hadn't met every expectation of yours? Were you questioned? Did he really love me? Did he really accomplish the things that he said that he was going to accomplish where your faith which once burned so brightly began to dim? And you and maybe even those with you made the decision Take a deep breath and to turn away from your Jerusalem, that place where you experienced him, and to begin to slowly walk away and make your way back to the things you'd always known before you met him, to your Emmaus. Well, these men walk and 
and they express to this man whom they don't recognize as Jesus that we had hoped in him. We were hoping in him. And they conclude this thought by saying this, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. In other words, and, uh, the, today is the day he was supposed to be there and we were there in Jerusalem and we didn't see him. So now we've left. Now we're returning. Again, sometimes at even the beginning of the third day, sometimes it doesn't meet your hopes and expectations. That does not mean, be encouraged. It doesn't mean that God has not done the thing just like he said. It simply means that our eyes haven't recognized it, that our eyes haven't seen it. And then these men, they begin to continue to speak to the Jesus whom they don't recognize. Sometimes in our grief, in our confusion, in our anxieties, sometimes we fail to recognize the voice of him who's spoken to us before. They, they speak to him and and they, they even tell us that there were certain women that were with us and they, they came to the tomb early in the morning and, and, and when they didn't find his body, they came back and they told us they had visions of angels and, and they said that he was alive. And then there were those who were with us who left and they went to the tomb and they did find the tomb empty just like the women had said. But him, they didn't see. Here they speak, they ran back, but the women didn't see Jesus. Peter, John didn't see Jesus, and here they are speaking with him. Yet they don't see Jesus. He is with us in our grief. He is near to a broken heart, and of him it's written that a contrite spirit, he, will, he, he, he won't. Tonight, he's close to those who are broken in heart. He's well acquainted with grief. And here he simply says in verse 25, if you'd like to read it with me, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, yet they didn't know him. And they draw near to a village where they're going. So understand, this has been a seven-mile walk. They've spoken with him, but didn't recognize that it was him. And they're nearly at the end of the seven-mile road to Emmaus. Nearly completing that journey, the, the number seven, is, it's important in the Bible, and it so often signifies completion. And here they are nearly completed on their road to get back to Emmaus. Jesus had walked with them to nearly the end of their seven-mile road. He met with them. He spoke to them of the promises and prophecies of the scripture. He taught them, and all the while they mourned him and missed him. And Jesus said this, and I take great heart in it. He even would have gone on further. You may feel like you have been on your seven-mile road away from the promise that, that, that you lost heart at some point, and it was hard to hold on to faith. These men are an unbeliever's but they are drifting and they are walking away. Their hearts want to believe, but they're walking away. Jesus, he walks with them to, to nearly the end as they walk in the opposite direction of where they knew Jesus to be because they had lost hope and they had lost him in their sight. As they journey this road back to the old life, yet Jesus leaves where he was in Jerusalem to pursue them 
He talked with them, but they failed to recognize them. He had done just as he said. He had left the 99 to pursue the, those who had left the flock, those who were losing out. And on this last mile to Emmaus, there he communed with them. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus is chasing us down today, even if you feel like that until this moment and until this day that, that your behaviors, your words, your actions have turned their back on God. I want to encourage you. Jesus pursues us this day and in this moment. The scripture says finally, and you can read it in verse 29, that they constrained him. And they said these words, abide with us for it's toward evening and the day is far spent. They're almost there. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. You ever felt that? <laughs> the glimpse of faith, the glimmer of faith. You recognize that it's Jesus. And then, where did he go? Here they choose not to get discouraged for they only needed that measure of faith. They only needed that knowledge that it was Jesus who had been with them, that his promise was still alive. And they look at each other in verse 32 and they say to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, on the road where we were traveling away from him, from where he told us to stay while we traveled away from him? Didn't our heart burn within us? Well, he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and they returned to Jerusalem. Do you understand this? this their, their journey could have been completed at the end of the seven miles on the road back to unbelief, back to a normal life. But here they chose right before their journey has come to an end when they decide to stop and commune with this man who is speaking to them in a way that no man has ever spoken before. And when he is revealed to them in the, in the blessing and in the break, breaking of the bread, they choose not continue their journey to Emmaus. They immediately recognize that he is the Christ, that his promise is alive, and they have the courage to turn around and travel the seven miles back from Emmaus to Jerusalem. It wasn't a seven-mile road. It could have ended there, but it became a new seven-mile road, and it was a journey back to where Jesus had told them to be, a journey back to the people of God. They recognize in this moment, so I, I, I need more than you and me. We need to be with the believers. We've got to get back and spread this good news. Uh, others may have seen an empty tomb, but we have spoken with him and he broke the bread as his body was broken. He broke the bread for us. We've got to tell someone. And so the scripture says that very hour they returned to Jerusalem. I have a feeling that their pace was slow and their heads hang low as they walk toward Emmaus. But I have a feeling I just have a feeling that their pace was a little bit faster, that they may have run part of the way back to Jerusalem to be able to spread this good news. When they got there, they gathered with those disciples and they said this, the Lord is risen. Indeed, he has appeared to Simon. And they told them about the things that would happen on the road. And they told them how Jesus was known to them in the breaking of bread. They stopped running. They stopped walking away from him long enough to commune with him. And during that meal, he's known to them. They here have a new infusion of hope and light and faith that has filled them. It fueled them on their journey back to Jerusalem. Someone take heart. Recognize that what you are feeling is the same Jesus that we are feeling as his words are spoken right here in this room. And that is faith enough to give you the courage 
to choose to make your journey back to Jerusalem. And this journey was a journey where they thought they would simply go and encourage the other believers and give the good news of the gospel. But this journey had more in store for those who would follow him closely. Now, the scripture says, as they're speaking these things to the disciples in Jerusalem, it's got to be nighttime by the time they've arrived. And as they've made this 14-mile journey now, eh, that they're speaking these things and that Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. And he said this, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened. (laughs) During these times of, of crisis that we're in, in pandemics such as these or other trauma that we experience, we often pray for the peace of God. But in order to have the peace of God, we must first have peace with God. The peace of God is not me feeling better for a moment. It is coming into right and pure, repented, godly relationship with Jesus. See, their doubt has affected them so much and their grief has affected them so much so that to the extent that he is there in speaking and they can't believe him, they're terrified, they're frightened. And then Jesus continues to speak to them and it says in verse number 45, he opened their understanding that they may comprehend the scriptures. We've got to know that without Jesus opening our heart and mind to what is written in the scriptures, we cannot have true revelation of it. Today, if you'll commune with Jesus, if you'll make these moments with Jesus, he will come in and he will open your mind to the things of God. That only comes from a relationship with him. Jesus says, It says that he showed them his scars to prove that he was indeed the risen Christ. And they still have problems believing. Well, after he opened their understanding in verse number six, it's written this. He says that thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to raise the dead or raise from the dead the third day. This is the reason. And that repentance... And remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Oh, Cleopas and friend that were on your road to to Emmaus, aren't you glad that you made your way back to Jerusalem? Because this is where repentance begins. This is where remission of sins is going to be experienced right here in Jerusalem. And Jesus had said this to them, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon on you tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high he had told them it's written in Acts 1 and 8 that when the Holy Ghost had come upon them they would receive power and they would be witnesses there in Jerusalem and then their witness would their impact would begin to stretch forth into other cities and other areas until it went to the very ends of the earth and they obeyed him And they, with this new faith, it fueled them to wait, to wait on the promise of the Father. Now they weren't going to be discouraged. They obeyed and they went and they did wait until he came again. Oh, he had ascended into heaven, but he was coming again. Make no mistake, the disciples recall the words that he spoke to them. I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. There they had gathered in Jerusalem and as it was the next Jewish feast was being celebrated. It was the feast of Pentecost, the feast of the, uh, uh, the feast of the harvest. And in Acts 2 and in verse number 1, many disciples, about 120, had gathered together in this upper room. The scripture says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there and she experienced this. I have to believe that Cleopas and friend were there as well. I just choose to believe that. 
There's 120 of them in this upper room. And the scripture says in Acts 2 and 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And it sat right upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance where you're sitting or where you're standing with me on this day. I want you to know that this same Holy Ghost, this same Holy Spirit can come to you and fill you just as it did on the day of Pentecost. Listen, this gift of the Holy Spirit, this evidence of speaking in tongues didn't only happen in Acts chapter 2. We read about it all throughout the scripture. In fact, on that same day, Peter, who originally had denied Jesus three times and went back and wept sorrowfully, this Peter now inspired and endued with faith, having freshly received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, known by the fact that he was speaking languages he had never been taught. He goes out into the crowds. They begin to gather. There are so many Jewish people from everywhere there for the Feast of Pentecost. He begins to preach on those streets with the other apostles. And when they hear him preaching, the Bible says when they hear, heard this, they were cut to the heart. And in Acts 2 and 37, they said to Peter and to the rest of those apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Make no mistake, on this birthday of the early apostolic church, they were saying, what do we do since we are guilty of sin? Since we are guilty, what do we do? How do we make it right? How can we be rescued from our sin? How should we be saved? And then Peter looked at them. And he said to them, repent. Does this remind you of Cleopas and his friend? Walking a long seven mile road away from their promise. They experienced this Jesus and they turned back to the promise. He says, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Even me, even you. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. It doesn't matter how many miles you've walked away from him. It's to you and to your kids and to all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call. And the way that they receive the gospel on that day is the same way we receive the gospel today. For the gospel is not only to be spoken. It's not only to be believed but it is to be appropriated. That is, it is to be obeyed. I've got good news for you today. In the midst of all the bad news that you've heard for several weeks, we have good news today. Jesus died. This is the gospel. He died. He was buried and he rose again. He died to pay the penalty of sin for you. He was buried in a borrowed tomb for you and he rose again for you. This is God who is for us who can be against us just as Jesus died we obey the gospel we embrace the gospel we receive the gospel by dying out to our old ways dying out to our sin by repenting of sin the way that Peter commanded them to and just as Jesus was buried, we are buried with him in water baptized. As he was covered in that tomb, we are covered in the waters of baptism. Jesus himself said in Mark 16 and 16, he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The scripture tells us that we are buried with Christ in baptism. This is the gospel. And just as Jesus rose again with a new life, we don't have to to remain dead and buried we too can rise again and we can walk in the newness of life we only need the breath of God the pneuma of God the spirit of God to fill us the same way 
that it did the early Christians in the book of Acts. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is good news for me, and it is good news for you. It is the power of God unto salvation, and you, you may have walked away, and you may have felt your hopes and dreams had seemed dashed. You may have walked in completely the opposite direction of this Jesus, or maybe your faith has just grown dim over time and through circumstance and grief and anxiety. But I want you to know today Jesus is near to the hurting heart today. You can return to him today. Stop for a few moments with us if you would and invite him to come in and commune with you. This invitation, Jesus, would you come and die? Would you come and commune with me? Would you spend a few moments with me, Jesus? This is the turning point. Listen to his familiar voice. Listen to this voice as he speaks to you. Let him reveal himself to you. You and I can experience this right now. Oh, I wonder if you would spend a moment and pray with me today. Today, Jesus. Lord, we reach out to you today, Jesus. Lord, today, Jesus, we come near to you. God. Oh, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin. Jesus is calling. Yes, he's calling. Can you hear his voice? Oh, I feel the spirit of God. Have you come to the end of yourself? Come on, put down the device. Just put everything down. Lay it all down before him. Oh, it's just you. Jesus is calling. And Jesus. It's just your family. And Jesus. Oh, come to the altar, the His arms are open arms to you. Are open wide. It's here. Is born with the blood of That's it. Jesus Lord, today we repent of our sins, God. To today, God, we're making the, the decision to follow you, Jesus. I feel this glimpse on this resurrection Sunday. I feel it, God, the spark in my heart. Oh, Jesus. Oh, it's through his precious blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it today. That's it today. He's here. Yes, Jesus. Yes. Even if you've been on the road to Emmaus. There's no reason to wait. It's time to turn. Jesus is glory. It's time to turn back to Jerusalem. Let's turn this into a 14 mile road. Oh, yes. From the ashes a new. Can you feel him? Jesus is glory. Oh, let's respond to him. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness yes. was born with yes. the precious blood yes. of Jesus Pray just like that. Oh, come to the altar. Take a moment, and these singers and I are going to pray for you in your home right now because I feel like God wants to pour His Spirit into your life. If you've, if you've experienced this, yet it's been a long time for you, I want you to know you can be renewed in the Spirit of God in these very moments. If you've turned your back, go ahead and open your heart. Before your understanding can be opened, your heart needs to be opened. Open your heart to this Jesus. Hear Him speak words of life to you, words of hope to you. Today, in the name of Jesus, we pray for all of our friends of greater life on this day. God, we pray today in the name of Jesus. 
Ah, that you would visit us just as you visited the early believers through the gift and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. For it is written, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. My sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Oh, son of God, daughter of God, children of God, this is our day. Hallelujah. Let new life, let new life begin to rise up within you. That's it. Oh, in the name of Jesus. That's it in Jesus' name. Let that new life rise. Oh, let it rise. Let it rise. On this resurrection Sunday, rise up. Rise up. Yes, oh God. Yes, oh God. Today, today he's given you a new life. Today, Jesus has given you a new life. Why don't you with us lift your hands to God and just begin to worship him. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Today in Jesus' name, we love you and we worship you, oh God. You've given us a new life. You've given us a new name, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. And we thank you this day. Somebody just begin to lift your voice and worship him. Let's thank him today in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. That's it. Sing that. A new creation in Christ. The old has gone. There's new life. I've turned around. I live by faith, not by sight. Not by sight. Sunday from greater life to you we love you if God is doing something in your life if God is blessing you drop a comment 
in the comment field. Let us know. Contact us if you have never been baptized with the name of Jesus spoken over you in baptism. Contact us. We will find a way to make that happen as soon as you would like it to happen. Everybody take a moment. Wish everyone a happy Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. We love you. We can't wait to see you again as Brother Eddie. We've got technicians all in the back. God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you.